for management. She does a whole heck of a lot to support the CFO community. And I think uh, it was wonderful that she could join us today. So two years ago, um, the entire financial management community of DHS came together and gave us input to help build and round out what the form, what the previous CFO Chip Fulton has laid out, had laid out for our vision 2021 for the financial management community of the department. Um, we boiled it down to four goals and got everybody's input and then the leadership of the department came together and built those out. First goal, people first. Second goal, decision support. We have a lot of things underway to do a whole bunch of stuff related to decision support. Third goal, making deliberate resourcing decisions. And fourth goal, being good stewards of the taxpayer dollars. And I think everything that you'll hear today, you'll kind of see fit within those buckets. We have a lot of good things to go through with you, but what I'm gonna do is talk about the first goal. It's my pleasure to talk about the first goal, people first. Um, one of the CFO community's core values is what we're here for today, and that's li living, or we changed the name, by the way, reprint, living a leadership lifestyle. And leadership um, is defined as making a difference. That's all it is. No matter what grade level you are, GS5 to SES, making a positive difference, and as the Deputy Secretary said, being impactful in somebody else's life around you. So think about that. Think about how you lead every day. Um, think about at the end of your day, did you make that positive difference in somebody else's life? And I get to talk to you about a uh, couple minutes about those leadership programs and the work that we have underway to be a workplace of choice for highly skilled and talented people delivering financial excellence. That is what we are here all about. Now we have a very, we set out two years ago, we defined an operational plan related to our strategic plan. We came up with our human capital strategy to bolster that up and all of the goals and objectives that fit within there. We are working right now, and we you'll see in the numbers, because we've got to do the numbers, we love the numbers, we're CFOs, um, that we are building a pipeline of financial excellence and leadership within the department. We are going to get to a place where we have brought our financial professionals in at the most junior level, and we've cultivated them through multiple so core training, mentorship, exposure to different management dis disciplines outside our little functional areas, that we are doing that today. I would like, we're gonna get to the point where we don't have to post on USA Jobs. Now, some technical human capital person is gonna tell me, you can't not do that. Um, but I'll say, we are, I already know, I know who is going to be my next GS15 division director of that division because you know what? I saw them six years ago enter, the financial enter into the financial professionals program, go through that GS11, 12 leadership program, go through the 13, 14 program, and they're there. They've had component experience. They've had headquarters experience. They've had experience outside the CFO swim lane, and they are a well-rounded person that is an extremely valuable mission enabler for the extremely valuable mission of this department. So that's what we're here to talk about today. It's my pleasure to go through um, and give you um, an update on where we are with those programs and to actually recognize, because we piloted it this, first, this past year, this is the first year of running it and we are building those programs into the future. Um, so, and our first goal, grow leaders as part of the human capital strategy. I kind of talked to you about these. Eight. There we go. Um, Vision 21, next slide. I don't really stick, I'm not doing a good job sticking to the slides. Okay, Amy, next slide. Wrong way. <laughs> Other way. 
Okay. All right, so I talked a little bit about, we piloted them this past year, um, piloted by the Workforce Development Action Group. That's a core community. We took a couple of big components, a couple of small components. Had the first 17 people in the pilot startup program for the, these leadership programs this year. So we, we have a total of 17 in there now. We will continue to grow and expand in 18 and beyond. Somebody's gotta watch me. Um, right, so the number is a little bit hard to see, but getting all the way up to 246884. Participants in this program, we are going to hit every single one of you. Any, any time throughout your career and starting, we have that pipeline of growth. These are all available to you. And the next advertisement for the next group of financial professionals, 1314s, and executive leadership program is going to be coming out this spring and summer as we start the second class and we continue to grow that program. Extremely excited for it. Um, I've had a tremendous amount of awesome feedback from the participants so far. Each program is made up, all of them are made up of a variation of details. You've got to get outside your swim line. Like training, mentorship, an IT activity, um, periodic group activities and all, all focused around actually working a lot within your cohort and getting to know your team members also so it's a very good opportunity to learn about other components to learn about the rest of the department and definitely to get outside your swim lane and to grow as an individual and then to bring that valuable experience back to your organization okay Financial professionals programs, GS7 through 9, pretty, I already talked through this, but I'd like to take an opportunity to recognize um, the first participants are currently in the financial, pro so if you would stand for me when I call your name and then we'll give you a round of applause because you guys are the next generation of this department's leadership and the current leadership we have. It's Walden Brasera, Brian Dow, Nathaniel Drell, Joy Durso, and Tania Diggs. Please stand, give me a round, round of applause. Thank you guys. Next, um, and we actually have the next cohort already in, uh, getting geared up to get in place. Um, for our GS 13s and 14s, a unique element of their leadership program is enrollment in the graduate schools, US, uh, graduate school USA's executive potential program where they can fine tune and start to build their leadership skills. When I call your name, please stand and remain standing and then we will uh, Please join me in recognizing these professionals who are continuing to build their leadership lifestyle. Cheryl Ferguson, Min Kim, Deborah Little, and Claire Williams. Stand. Okay, our GS 15s participate in the executive leadership program. Uh, the unique element of this uh, is a year-long enrollment in the Brookings Institute Executive Fellows Program. Now, I'll, I'll pause here uh, just to, to let you know how important these programs are, is when we stood it up and we piloted, and for the second year, um, the components all basically, they pay their own way, right? If they have a participant in the program, they pay for the educational part of the program, that part that costs, not the details and everything else that we um, actually structure around it. The CFOs and your CFO leadership community in this department believe so much in the value of what we're doing here today, and so do I, passionately, that two years out, budget lead time away, they agreed that it was so important that they transferred money from within their component to the CFO business line to continue these programs in perpetuity without having to do crazy IAA processes and et cetera. And to build it up and to have the support in place to run these at a level of 84 participants a year. 
So congratulations to how important we think we are. <laughs> we all think we're very important. Anyway, it was, it's a tremendous show of support. It's something we take very seriously to continue to build our pipeline of resources. Um, so let me go ahead and talk to you about the participants in the GS15. Anne-Marie Julen, Eric Littlepage, stand when I call your name, Tom Reynolds, Tommy Reynolds, Barbara Salinas, sorry if I said that wrong, Joseph and Joseph Sanger. Stand, give me a round of applause. Report starting soon. Okay, a unique, now you're gonna go, what happened to that 11, 12? You're going out of order, we like things logically, but I need to talk about this one last. A uh, unique element of the 1112 program is enrollment, again, in the Graduate School USA's executive, uh, executive Leadership Program that's targeted at this grade level. So we're excited to have the first brand new group of future leaders that's graduated from the 1112 program. On, they're graduating on May 7th. As I mentioned earlier, we exceeded, oh, I didn't mention. So in, for the 2018 cohort, we've exceeded um, our part planned participants, so we have 13 people going into the next class. Um, and I am proud to present the first graduating class of the GS1112 Leadership Program who completed their program in February. Getting all my dates. So this is a huge accomplishment. When I call your name, please come up to get your graduation certificate. Robert Brown, TSA. Carissa Matthews. Bong Tam Nguyen. Bong Tam Nguyen. Come on up. <laughs> Come on. Let's give them all a round of applause. There's actually one of the training breakouts. If you'd like more information on these programs or on other career development opportunities, attend today's 3 p.m. session presented by the Workforce Development Division. Um, I think their overview of the career path guides and the expectations for what we uh, have for our workforce is something that's invaluable as participants in this community and as leaders in this community. So take the opportunity to be there. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you, you're up now, uh, someone who has not only built a leadership lifestyle, but helps us build one too, Mr. Dave Weinberg. <laughs> you think? Well, good morning. So I need you to do three things. Uh, first, stand up. Reach out to your neighbor and say, thank you for being awesome. <laughs> It shouldn't take that long. You are so awesome. Now say, thank you for being different. All right, sit down. Whoa, where'd the lights go? You, you can turn the lights back on. Thank you. Yeah, I don't have any slides. So Burl said I was going to talk to you about taking care of people. The reality is 
Um, I've done that talk to most of you already, so I came up with another talk called Taking Care of People 2. <laughs> T-O-O, two. Kind of clever how I did that, huh? Yeah, okay. But the whole premise of taking care of people still resonates with this talk as well because it's important to do that, right? It's important to take care of people, right? Right? Are you sleeping already? Is it important to take care of people? Yeah. yeah. I mean, in fact, there's probably nothing more important than taking care of people. Would you agree with that, sir? Yes, sir. All right. He said, yes, sir. He agreed. There's nothing more important than taking care of people. So if I was to ask you, sir, what does it mean to you to take care of people? Relax, it's a rhetorical question. You don't have to say a damn thing. <laughs> but if I was to ask you what it means to take care of people, or you, ma'am, what does it mean to you to take care of people? You, you might come up with a few things, you know, one or two. You, you give them awards like we did earlier. We give them awards like we did earlier, or you... You take, send them to training like you're doing now, and you'll come up with a few, but, but the reality is that if it's so important to take care of people, and I think you agree with me that it is, then shouldn't we know what that means? Shouldn't we know what that means to each of us? And I say each of us because each of us are different. Remember you just said, thank you for being different. Each of us are different, and so what it means to you to take care of people is different than what it means to you and you and you and you and you. But we ought to know what that means. We ought to have it in the front part of our brain so that we can do it deliberately and improve upon it as we do it. Doesn't that make sense? Taking care of people, nothing more important. So I do that one talk on taking care of people, came up with ten more things of how it of what it means to take care of people. So this is kind of a new talk, so bear with me a little bit. And the first one you've heard before. You heard it from Stacy. You heard it from that lady that was here before Stacy. What was her name? Claire, Claire the, the big dog lady. <laughs> that you have to make a difference. And what's cool about making a difference is the fact that we're all different. The fact that we're all different makes us the same in the fact that we make a difference. Did you follow me there? The fact, all right, let me, let me, I might have screwed that up. <laughs> we're all different, but the fact that we make a difference makes us the same. That's where I was going with that. Has anyone heard the starfish story? No? So I'm wearing the starfish on my lapel. Someone asked me what that was for. A guy gave that to me. He said, thank you for making a difference. The starfish story is pretty cool. There was a terrible storm at the beach. About a gazillion starfishes washed up on, on the beach. There were thousands of them. And a little girl was out there dutifully picking up a starfish and tossing it back into the ocean. And there started to be a crowd gathering watching this little girl just pick up a starfish and toss it back into the ocean. And finally, an elderly man walked down to the beach and told the little girl, he said, I don't know what you think you're accomplishing here. There's no way you can get all the starfish back into the sea. You're not even making a difference. And she was so dejected. She looked down at her feet. She finally looked back up at the man. She looked back down, picked up a starfish, threw it back into the sea and said, I made a difference for that one. And then she kept doing it. And finally the man realized the lesson there. And he started picking up starfish. And then all the people on the dock came down to the beach. And by the end of the day, all the starfish were back in the sea. It doesn't take much to make a difference. Back in my Air Force days, I was the director of budget for Education and Training Command, and I was not known for my budget prowess. But I got this guy, he was a lieutenant colonel, and he was known as, he was known throughout the Air Force as the best budget guy 
in the Air Force. And so let me give you a little idea of my lack of budget prowess. So when I got to Education and Training Command, I had to go brief the Air Staff on our $4 billion budget. And so I had my team put together our, our briefing, and I went up there, and it turns out I went on the wrong day with the wrong briefing with the wrong numbers. It was not a good day. So I was so excited when this young lieutenant colonel was coming into our office, and it was like, you know, one of those, one of those shows where, you know, you're running to meet the, you know, just going to give him a big hug. And, and it was interesting, we didn't get along that very first meeting, because he didn't trust me because of who had grown me. And he said, listen, Colonel, you just stay in that office and I'll take care of the budget. <clears throat> and so, the truth is I called personnel and tried to get him fired. <laughs> but they said I had to keep him. And what was interesting about that relationship that soon turned into a fast friendship was I realized there was nothing I could do to teach this guy about budget. He had, and he had come to me fully baked. And, and what I mean by that is he didn't think there was anything else he could learn. And I'm telling you, about budget, there was nothing else he could learn. He had, he had just come from a competitively selected Air Force school. He had just come from command. He had just come from Air Force putting together the whole frickin' budget for the world, for the Air Force. There was nothing I could teach him about budget. So we went on these trips to our 13 bases in Education and Training Command, and every trip I brought him a book. So the first trip I hand him a book. We're sitting in the, in the airport waiting, and he's reading something, Sports Illustrated. And, he's, and he looks at me and says, what do you want me to do with that, sir? Because he felt like if he put sir at the end of the sentence, it was okay. And I said, well, I, I want you to read the book. He says, no, I'm good. And so, so understand, I was a colonel, which is a grade of 06, and he was a lieutenant colonel, which is a grade of 05. And so I said, no, no, I, really, I want you to read the book. He says, sir, I, I, I don't read. Well, that's not true. I read two things. I read Sports Illustrated and the sports page, and I got them both, so I'm good. Thank, thanks, though. <laughs> I'm like, well, no, I, I really think I want you to read the book. And he said, look, if it, if it came out in a movie and I saw the movie, I'll take credit for reading the book. <laughs> and so we had a math lesson where six is more than five. And he read the book. <laughs> and the next trip we went on, he read another book and another book. And see, he thought that I was bringing him along because they might ask me a budget question. And I, I wouldn't know how to answer it. But I was really bringing him along to maybe teach him something about leadership. That lieutenant colonel turned into something pretty amazing. He's one of your big bosses, Chip Fulgham. Pretty cool. And I thought I was going to be here today. I was going to give him my starfish, but the hell with him. <laughs> so taking care of people. The second one is you have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in your people. Think about that. You have to believe in yourself and your people. What was interesting about that when I was writing this particular talk, I, I thought about believing in yourself and believing in your people. And the words that came to my mind were confidence, trust, growth, Learning, motivation, 
an attitude. This is harder than it looks. Isn't that amazing? Confidence, trust, growth, learning, motivation, and attitude. Is there anything wrong with any one of those words? If those are the words that came to my mind, and I know you guys could come up with a whole lot of other words, but if those were the words that came to my mind when I thought about, when I wrote about believe in yourself, believe in your people, I think that's pretty powerful. Because all that stuff happens when you believe in your folks. Now, with regard to believing in your folks, there's, there's three rules of, of life that I live by. And rule one is believe you can whip the world. Rule two is grab the bull by the horns. And rule three is don't sweat the small stuff. If you believe you can whip the world, there's nothing you can't accomplish. But you have to grab the bull by the horns. You have to get off your butt. You have to stop complaining about it. You have to go do it. And, and understand that there's going to be small stuff that get in your way that's going to try to stop you from accomplishing what you set out to do. And you have to view it as small stuff and figure out how to go through it, over it, around it, under it, just get by it. And, and you have to live those rules. You have to teach your folks those rules. There was a young guy that came to work for, for us. That's high. <laughs> that came to work for us. Hey, where'd you go? Good to see you. Good to see you. There's a guy, young guy that came to work for us, and his job was to, at Carney and Company, and his job was to be a modeler, um, at run Excel spreadsheets. And he was a whiz kid at Excel spreadsheets. And so I sat him down because I believed in him. And I said, John, what, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you know how those young kids are? They're like, I'm good. <laughs> I'm doing Excel. I'm good. I'm like, yeah. But let's talk 10 years from now. Where are you? 15 years from now, where are you? Do you want to be doing Excel for the rest of your life? And he kind of looked at me puzzledly, and I said, listen, you're at one of the best CPA firms in the nation. That's an opportunity. How about I connect you with some of those CPA people, because I'm not one of them. I'm not smart enough. And maybe you go see if that's a path you want to take. Because, you know, Excel is about putting little numbers in boxes, kind of like being a CPA. <laughs> I think. So he went and talked to a couple of them. And he said, yeah, it sounds pretty interesting. So we developed a plan that would get him some more education so he could sit for the CPA exam. He's been with Carney three years. He didn't have an accounting degree. It was something in economics, so he had to take some extra courses. He passed the CPA exam just this last year. It's, it's about believing in your folks. It's about setting expectations higher than where they think they can reach, and then giving them the love and support and guidance and every now and again one of those but you get the confidence, trust, growth, learning, motivation, and attitude. Okay, so the next one, I actually wrote two things down, but I combined them into one. But it's still two things. But it's number three. <laughs> it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to be wrong. But when you're wrong, you have to realize it, admit it, fix it, and learn from it, and then get over it, and then move on. And when you allow your folks to be wrong, when you allow them to make mistakes, they're going to try new stuff. They're going to solve tough problems. But if you take their head off when they make a mistake, they're going to be like, damn it, that hurt. I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to try new stuff. 
But you have to teach them also that if they make a mistake, they have to realize it, admit it, fix it, learn from it, get over it, and move on. I got a guy that works for me now. He's never wrong. Well, there was the one time he thought he was wrong and he wasn't. You just got that? He makes excuses for everything. It was never his fault. It was not him. The guy still hasn't learned. He's not going to go far without learning that lesson. And so the second part to this was, if you do something wrong, apologize. Apologize boldly. Say, you know what? I screwed up. I'm sorry. It doesn't make it all better, but it sure heads in that direction. But if I don't take responsibility for my screw-up, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be like a cut on my arm that I didn't attend to. And what's going to happen to that cut on my arm? It's going to get infected. Just like this screw-up that I didn't apologize for. And it's going to get worse and, and gross and bad. So you have to apologize for it boldly. I was a comptroller commander at Grand Forks Air Force Base. I said something disparaging about one of my people to somebody else that got back to her. It was very wrong of me to do. I don't know why I did it. The lady was crushed. She should have been. I went up to her and I said, Catherine, I am so sorry. I don't know what got into me. I don't know why I said it, but I apologize. I don't know that our relationship working together was ever the same, but it certainly improved and got better because I apologized directly, boldly. We're going to screw things up. We're going to say stuff that we don't mean, but we got to recognize it and not let it get infected. Apologize boldly. Bad news doesn't get better with time. I learned that with my wife a lot. <laughs> Got to tell her, because they know stuff. They know you did it anyways. I don't know how. <laughs> but that whole accept responsibility, that gets to also the crux of being a leader. When I was a finance officer at Blyville Air Force Base, one of my guys screwed up the commander's pay. The comp that wasn't good. <laughs> the comptroller called me down to his office. I was a first lieutenant. He was a major. He says, I want to know who screwed that up. I said, I did, sir. He says, no, you didn't. I want the name of the airman that screwed it up. I said, Dave Weinberg. He said, 